Hey everybody, it's Sean Gibbons from the Communications Network. How are you? Don't worry, your computer's not broken. I'm playing you a little bit of Louis Armstrong to kick us off on this Thursday afternoon. Chances are you are with us because you were expecting to hear from Dr. Richard Wenzel, the epidemiologist and infectious disease doc, and, uh, and someone who's been kind enough to be with us over the last month and a half, keeping us updated. This is the fourth time he'll be with us and share what we're learning. Of course, this disease of COVID-19 and the novel coronavirus is something that the whole world is learning about, is learning more about each and every day. Uh, before we get to that, a couple little pieces of housekeeping as folks are entering the room. I see you all coming in. If you would, again, chances are you've been with us before, so I'm going to sound like a broken record. But go ahead and, and take your computer uh, mouse or your finger or whatever it is you use to manipulate your computer. Go into the chat function, if you would, and see, make sure that that's open and says all panelists and attendees. Mine is preset, says all panelists. So make sure you, like me, you're talking to everybody. And I'm going to go ahead and type in and just say, hi, everyone. It's Sean, and if you would add your name, Tom, hey, uh, let's see, Kirsten and Lishka, hey everybody, Sarah from Chicago. Let's do this while y'all are adding this. Uh, Brene Brown, uh, the professor down at the University of Houston has this really cool idea of a two word check-in. So if you would, you've added your names in, hey Tiffany, hey Abby, Deb, nice to see you, Liz from the Hilton Foundation, how are you my friend? Uh, Betsy, how are you from Peak in Annapolis? Why don't you go ahead and not only tell us your name, your organization, and where you're from, but just two words. How are you feeling right now? How are you feeling? Doug, my friend from Pittsburgh. We were just chatting on the phone the other day. Uh, nice to see you. Hope you're all doing well. Jamie Perky. Who's feeling perky? Derek. That's cool. Tired but optimistic. Okay. Hanging in. Stretched. Concerned. Blessed and healthy. Absolutely. Uh, and Brene Brown has a great webinar coming up, so we'll just toss that into the, uh, the chat, which you can find it there. What else we got? Katie, how you doing? Slightly optimistic today. Yeah, it's strange, right? Like one day you feel good and then the next day it's kind of rough. Felt like I hit the wall a little bit the other day, but today I'm feeling good and grateful. Um, weary and nervous, Deb. Yeah, I think that's how a lot of us are feeling. Focused and bird song. Oh, I want to be where you are. It's raining here. The birds are kind of quiet where we are. Overwhelmed, but okay, Carly. Yeah, I think it's okay to feel this way. I think this is perfectly natural, and I think Dr. Wenzel is going to tell us a little bit more about that in a quick minute. While you're doing that, a couple other things you should know. We are making a recording of this, as we always do. So you'll find that on YouTube either a little bit later today or first thing tomorrow on the network's YouTube channel and on connetwork.org. Also, our colleague, Carrie Klein, as she always does, is making live notes, so we'll have those available for you to review a little bit later if you want to share that out with other colleagues. Uh, he's going to give us some good guidance and maybe some, some information you'll need to be making some decisions as we look into the fall and beyond. Uh, what else can I tell you? Our colleague, Gabby Ferris, who's down in her apartment in Washington, D.C., she's taking notes on Twitter right now. If you go to the, I'm going to turn Mr. Louis Armstrong off here, or turn him down a little bit. Uh, if you want to go to the hashtag ComNetLive, C-O-M-N-E-T-L-I-V-E, you will find notes that Labby is making live as we go through this presentation. And now just a couple pieces of housekeeping. My colleague, Tristan Mojave, is running the deck. Tristan, if you would, take it to the next slide. Uh, this is the first thing I want to tell you about. Hopefully, you got an email from me uh, yesterday inviting you to take a survey. Uh, our friends at Atlantic 57, which is the research and design arm of the Atlantic magazine, have donated their time. And then a number of our friends from the field, so folks at Ford Foundation and Surfrider, uh, goodness, Planned Parenthood, the MacArthur Foundation, a lot of Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, a lot of them took some time to answer some questions for us. And through that, we built this survey. And now we'd like to hear from all of you as well as your colleagues. So if you would, if you uh, go to our social channel, and Cherry, Carrie's probably going to put this in the chat, and there it is, take the survey. It's going to take you about 10 minutes. It's not super short, but it's not super long, and our aim is to just try to get a bead on how are folks working right now, because we know it's different, right? It's got to be, and we're all testifying to that in our checking on how we're doing with one another. Um, so that survey is going to be open until next Friday, May the 8th, so you have a little bit of time, but if you don't mind, if you can spare us 10 minutes, I know things are busy, please, please, we'll all be better and smarter if we have sort of a baseline of how people are working, what they're doing, what maybe they stopped doing, and all of that will be captured through that survey. Mr. T, if you would, take us forward. Uh, the link, Chris Kirsten, is right up above you in the chat. So it's, it's a kind of a gobbledygook thing. But if you look in your email and you're on our email list, you will see an email from me. So if you just search for Sean, you'll see a note which has the links in there. And it's also on our LinkedIn page and across social for us as well. Uh, this is the comms triage kit. Really quickly, again, you know that this exists now. And it's thanks to all of your help. People have been contributing to this. 
but this is a one-stop shop place to go to get information about how to try to think about and manage your communications. Now, looking into the future, it's based on the CDC's Crisis Communications Manual. Our colleagues Doug Hathaway and Peter Loge and Kristen Grimm and a number of other folks went through and along with you helped to make this thing what we think is really one of the most best of breed kind of guides to take you through it. Attached to it, there's also a spreadsheet that shows you examples of work that other folks have done too. So feel free to avail yourselves of that. And I'm guessing Carrie will toss a link into that triage kit in just a minute. Mr. T, if you'd take us forward. The other thing, again, you've heard me say this if you've been with us before, if you are a network member, this is coming very, very soon. And this is a new program we're gonna be able to offer called Circles. Put simply, it is your network within the network. And excuse me if I have someone walking in behind me, that's either my wife or a little person. Um, that's what happens when you're working from home. Uh, Circles is gonna be your network within the network. So we're gonna organize you based on either the job you have, so the role you play in your organization, maybe you're managing the team, maybe you're running digital, whatever it is, we're going to try to connect with other people with that kind of role or function at other organizations. Or, or we're going to gather you based on the issues that your organization's focused on. So maybe you work on social justice, maybe you work on climate, maybe you work on health. We're going to connect you with other people doing communications work at other organizations that put their focus there. All right. That's what I got, I think, for the top. With that, it's my deep honor and pleasure to hand this over and turn off Mr. Armstrong finally to Dr. Richard Wenzel. Uh, I'm not going to go much further. Sir, if you'd like. Thank you once again for being with us. We are all really grateful. And as you know, there's a whole bunch of us with us. And Thanks, Sean. Trying my, to my pleasure. find our way through this. But for now, if you would, sir, just take it away. Well, I put on this uh, cover slide primarily to let you know that uh, if you have burning questions afterwards, I have my email there. And I will mention perhaps the names of drugs, but uh, let you know that I have no uh, uh, equity in any kind of pharmaceutical product related to uh, health. So I have no uh, conflict and I think we would start that way. If I could have the next slide. So I want to start with uh, this uh, statement uh, uh, part of it. And uh, this Blaise Pascal is, was a very famous physicist as well as a mathematician and philosopher. In his math life, he actually uh, uh, specialized in probability. And so I have a quote here that says, we sail a vast sphere, ever drifting into uncertainty. Truth is so obscure in these times. And I thought, well, we're learning a lot about COVID-19, but we're still in the sea of uh, uncertainty as we go ahead. Next slide. So this slide actually shows you international trends um, and when you see in the y-axis are the daily death tolls and it goes from zero up to 2000 and on left to right the days since the average daily death passed three so we can level the playing field and if you look at the bottom Australia and I could put next to it New Zealand countries that got out early in all aspects of uh, the uh, COVID control. Uh, they had uh, social isolation very early and aggressively. They closed their borders. They had contact tracing that was aggressive and they had widespread testing. Uh, and you can see that their high in terms of daily deaths was about five. And both Australia and New Zealand, we're talking now about containment, but beyond that elimination. Uh, and I think they're on their way. Just go a little higher and you'll see Norway and I could put uh, next to that up higher is Aust Austria. These are two countries about the same size as Sweden and their death rates are probably fivefold lower, even though you don't see that here. So for Sweden, you might put them up a little higher where you see Ireland and India but Austria about the same size as Sweden, Norway, very much more aggressive. So I wanna make the point early that control really responds to social isolation. Now, if you go up a little higher, you can see this line, the yellow line that goes all the way up and then down to the right to China, which actually is now down to zero to one cases per day and opening up much more aggressively. So they got out a little bit late, 
but with an aggressive program, we're able to really cut down the number of deaths. Unfortunately, the countries that got a later start, those in Europe, France, Spain, Italy, and the UK at the top, while they're leveling off, uh, they're still around 500 down to about 300 uh, and have a long way to go. And unfortunately for us, we got started late. We had the highest peak. We're at 2000, we're leveling off, but we have a long way to go to come down. So the key point is early, aggressive, complete uh, isolation and ancillary approaches with testing, uh, and with contact tracing works. Next slide. So just uh, very quickly, you can see um, in a log scale on the left, the number of confirmed cases, and again, log scale on the right, the number of deaths in the United States. And you'll see this figure again, but from February to April, you can see that we're now past 1 million cases. And the total deaths that you'll see again uh, on the right hand side, uh, over 61,000. Um, so we're really beginning to flatten a little bit, but we haven't gotten to where we need to go yet. Next slide. So this is uh, partly uh, some data that I showed you before and then updated. So across the top, you see the reported cases in the United States, the reported deaths, and then I put a multiplier of 3.75 for cases. Some people think it ought to be five or tenfold higher than the reported ones. So what I've looked at here is how long does it take to double the cases or double the deaths? Now, if you look to the left side where it says one April, one April we had 200,000 cases, 2,000 to the right reported deaths. By the 4th of April, we had doubled the number of deaths to 4,000. So that means a doubling was in a three-day cycle at that early part. And you remember that New York was talking about two to three-day cycles. If you look at the cases, by 8 April, we had doubled the number of cases in this country to 400,000. And that was a seven-day cycle. And then just to look at the last time we met on the 15th of April, there were now 600,000 cases, up threefold from two weeks earlier, and 30,000 deaths reported, up 15-fold higher. And so that I was asking you to consider, what if this cycle was either one more cycle in the next two weeks, which is today, or two more cycles? So I predicted we'd have somewhere, if we doubled the 600,000, to 1.2 to 2.4 million, and in fact, as of uh, early today, we have over 1 million. So pretty close to a two week cycle. Similarly, at 15 April, we have 30,000 deaths. And if you predict either a one or two cycle in the next two weeks, you expect on the low end 60,000 or 120,000 deaths. And as of uh, early today, there are over 61,000 deaths. So the implication of looking at doubling time is the doubling interval for both new cases and new deaths in the last two weeks was over 15 days, probably 16 or 17. We'll know in another day or so. So that the question you might ask is what do we expect by the 1st of June? We might uh, say that if we're lucky or maybe you didn't do as well as we could have, we'll have another doubling in the next 30 days. So that would lead us to speculate possibly 2 million cases by the 1st of June, maybe over 100,000 deaths by the 1st of June. So I'm saying one of the metrics you can use to follow an epidemic is the doubling time of deaths and the doubling time of cases. Next slide. So just briefly, talk about the expanding spectrum of symptoms from COVID-19. And these are updated from CDC. Fever, cough, and shortness of breath were the three that they had uh, said were the most important. And just a couple of days ago said, we need to add a few more. Chills, including shaking chills that you sometimes see with severe flu or tropical viral infections. Muscle pain, headache, 
sore throat, and groups are now seeing new loss of taste or smell or both. But I want to add those that haven't been on the CDC list because clinicians across the country are talking about patients presenting with clotting problems, 30-year-olds, 40-year-olds with stroke. Trouble speaking, perhaps, or moving on one side might be a fluid or stroke, but they didn't expect it at that young age, and in fact, due to coronavirus. Heart attack, where the clot is now in the coronary artery, the artery that uh, in, uh, feeds oxygen to the heart muscle. So it could present the young person with a heart attack, may have chest pain or left arm pain, or clots in the lung, which we call pulmonary embolism. Uh, again, depends where the clot is, but in this case with pulmonary embolus, chest pain, shortness of breath. So the spectrum is wide and there are those out there, furthermore, that uh, we're not sure are really part of the spectrum, uh, except rarely, such as uh, rash that some of you read about. Next slide. So again, I wanna talk about tests in the next few slides and tell you a little bit uh, how they work. So with a valid test, there's a first step. And what happens is you have a new test and you say, okay, I wanna show in this group of people I have over here, we know that they're infected. And ask the question, with the new test, what proportion have a positive test, so-called sensitivity? And over here, we also have a group of people not infected, we know for sure. And what proportion of the new test has a negative test, showing it agrees? specificity. And what you want with those first steps, looking at known infected and known non-infected people, can you have a positive sensitivity of 95% and specificity of 95%? That would be a very good test to begin with. The next step, the second step, is then to take that to populations. And what you really focus on now is the test itself. Of all the people whose test is positive, what proportion are truly infected? That's predictive value positive. We wanna know how good the test predicts truly infected versus how many are false positive. Now a key concept is with the second step, a positive test has increasing value as the proportion of the population infected increases. So if we went from 5% infected which has many false positives, but fewer as a proportion infected, as a, more of us in the country get infected to 50% or more, those tests will work better. So it's a key concept that test depends on the prevalence of disease, in this case, infection. I'll give you some examples of that on the next slide. Go ahead to the next one, okay. So this is how predictive the test is depends on the widespread, the infection. So if you look at the four scenarios here, uh, mine doesn't show up here or, uh, all the time. Um, if you look at the, the scenarios are 5%, 10% of the community infected, 20% of the community infected, which could be our whole country or our state, all the way up to 50%, uh, if you will. So if we have, which I think is possible, only 5% of Americans truly infected, the test positive will show 47%. That means that almost half are false positives. And if you get up to 10% of Americans, that test is actually much better. We pick up now 68% are truly there. As we get to 20%, which we're not in close, 83% of the tests predict well, and up to 50%, uh, you would have 95% good prediction. The good news is in any scenario, if the test says you're negative, you really are negative, you are really susceptible. So in the middle it says as more Americans are infected, the predictive value of a test positive increases. So what do we do with this information? Well, today, if you said we're going out and we're gonna test everybody in the community with no symptoms, our false positives are about half. On the other hand, if we go to a busy emergency room with people who are filled with, they're complaining of fever, 
shortness of breath and a sore throat, uh, they're likely to be at least 50% sick people with, with COVID. That test is 95% accurate. So with sick people, the test works. Be skeptical, however, of a test positive, uh, be, but be assured of a test negative in asymptomatic people. So asymptomatic people, closer to the 5%, as you test people who have a lot of symptoms, we're gonna get a very, very good test. Next slide. Now the same thing could be true of antibody tests. If we're in a 5% prevalence, 5% only of the people infected, as the group at Stanford reported just a, a week ago or so, how good is that for telling us who's really been infected in the past? So if you assume 5% of the US population have been infected, there are many false positives as I've shown. Now for one estimate, how many are really infected, that's not a problem. I just have to take that number, multiply by a half to get the true number. What is a problem, however, is telling all the tests positive for antibody that, they have, that they're immune and that they can return to work or play. But if half are really false positive for antibodies, that half is still susceptible. The trouble is we don't know which half. We just know that half of them are false positives. Unfortunately, there are about 14 antibody tests out there. The FDA's looked at only four and approved four, even though the other 10 are out there. So they are even less predictive than an excellent test, 95% sensitive and specific. So one of the problems with low prevalence is these antibody tests have a lot of false positives. Next slide. So what do we know if we step back and look at the big picture of antibody testing? One thing we do know is, and it's been helpful, both in New York and California, there clearly are more infections than we thought. That means more people are infected, the denominator is bigger. However, if we, even if we use those numbers, the infection fatality rate is still 0.3 to 0.5%. That is three or five times higher than seasonal flu. And the, in, no matter how we look at numerator and denominator, today we know that over 65,000 people died. That incremental burden above what we expect from chronic diseases and influenza is a huge number. We still have many false positives with an antibody testing. And the problem is not with the antibody tests, the good ones, but with the low prevalence of infection. They don't work well at low prevalence. Most estimates assume that our numerator is valid, that the number of deaths. Some people question that and say, we really haven't counted all the people who, who are old and presented with a stroke or just died in their sleep, or they didn't have a test. So we probably have underestimated the numerator number of people who died, but not as grossly as the denominator. I would like to see us do random samples of five to 10% of our population to get true estimates broadly of where we are with this antibody in our population. And remind you, some of the available antibody tests are not valid, not approved by the FDA. Next slide. So, before we do social distancing, we need better numbers. We need something to tell us, by this policy, are we better or worse or the same? We need some metrics. Now, without testing data, I'd ask you to imagine a spaceship pilot with no instruments in rough weather. She wouldn't know the direction or altitude or speed of our spaceship. She wouldn't know the fuel level, the estimated time of arrival, and without instruments, whether or not she, the crew, and passengers will make it safely. And with test metrics, our pilot has the best scientific instruments. They're not perfect, they're the best. Our crew would announce the public health updates. And what I'd like to suggest is, in fact, Spaceship Earth is in flight rotating around the sun 
with millions of passengers hoping to avoid undue turbulence. And what we really need is widespread testing to be able to guide our flight. Next slide. So assuming we might have good metrics, what might those look like? Well, new cases or new deaths or new ICU patients per 24, for, per 14, that is the widest incubation interval, or two times that per 28 day interval. For example, if we knew in the last two weeks, there are very few new cases or deaths, pretty good information to say we're safe. If we knew for two times that, the uh, longest incubation, 28 days, we had no new cases or new deaths, we would be very happy uh, people on the earth. I also think that we need a random sample testing and like to see falling number of asymptomatic cases, which would mean that we're actually controlling this. And to do this, to fill it out, I'd say a random sample of antibodies of people looking for antibodies to gauge the rising prevalence in a community. So what we might see is in the summer of this year, small retail stores, bookstores, music stores, furniture stores, small uh, department stores, and obviously construction outside where we could have social distancing. No matter what we decide to do, I would say we're gonna need social distancing for the, at least through the summer for everybody and maybe longer for high risk people. There are schools that say they're gonna open in the fall and I'm not sure what that'll look like. They're gonna to to be very creative to maintain social distancing, perhaps have a hybrid distance learning with home and going to school. Colleges and universities will have to have maybe home learning for classes of 300 or more but maybe the advanced classes with smaller numbers and distancing. In the winter, some en uh, entertainment establishments may open if we have creative spaces. In spring, or Tony Fauci and others are optimistic, we may have, even as early as January, February, vaccine, which we would use, obviously, preferentially for high-risk people. No matter what, when these things open up, we're gonna to have to continue social distancing for high risk people. Maybe with new drugs for therapy, uh, we may be able to move this further ahead. There's some promising information about remdesivir, the antiviral that's come out and showed a modest improvement in days. It's not a home run, but as Tony Fauci said, proof of concept that we are on the right path with an antiviral. Next slide. So often the choices between looking at control of COVID or opening up the economy is said as a binary issue. And what I'd like to suggest to you, we need both. Of all the people taking COVID-19 seriously, there are also many of us that would say, we need to be concerned about economic devastation. We're all looking for that sweet spot where we do no harm or minimize it where we still preserve our economy. It should not be a binary issue. Next slide. So I think what we really need to do is recognize and discuss openly the tension between health and financial concerns. We need to be concerned about both. And we have to provide good health while providing a nationally funded financial bridge for businesses, no question. The policy decisions we make are not political, but medical public health issues, critical financial issues, and sometimes critical and gut-wrenching bioethical issues. The big bioethical issue we haven't asked because it makes us so uncomfortable, how many illnesses and how many deaths justify a certain percent improvement in the gross domestic product? Scary question. We have to be able to approach that. If we move ahead and we open up uh, a new wave of infections, we'll look at the losers in any pandemic. So these are the people who have the most to lose. If you see at the bottom, poor people, people of color, 
people who are frail, older grandparents, those with chronic morbidities, and nursing homes, which are comprised now 20 to 50 percent of the deaths in, in different states. The disenfranchised, of course, uh, such as those who are unregistered aliens. There are enthusiasts for crowding who are now becoming victims themselves. We've learned recently about the high risk Navajo tribe members and all of those working or living in crowded conditions, such as meat packers in the Midwest. These are the people who are the losers if we bet wrong and we don't balance the two competing issues. Next slide. So what I would pause for a second and say, while we're worrying about this, it have an urgent need right now to build robust influenza responses for the fall of this year and the winter of 2021. We need to worry about that now. And the way we do that is ask CDC to have widespread availability, promotion, and acceptance of the influenza vaccine. Uh, what we don't want is the continuing COVID-19, and it will not go away this summer. And we don't know how quickly it might even rise in the fall because we'll have people coming from southern hemispheres uh, to our summer and then infecting people in the late summer, early fall. We need, beside a vaccine, everyone to take it even if it's only partially effective widespread availability and accessibility of treating influenza. Drugs, for example, like oseltamivir, which is Tamiflu. Well, they're modest in their treatment of influenza, but they have a 90% uh, ability to prevent illness with a once a day dose. And that's exactly what we need to make sure every nursing home has that, every person uh, has that at low cost, if at any cost, who are high risk. We also need widespread availability for testing for flu and the spectrum of respiratory viruses, including SARS-CoV-2. People want to know if they have a respiratory infection. Doctor, do I have flu? Do I have COVID? Do I have some other virus, such as common cold virus or RSV, other ones? And we, if a failure to move on this immediately, a failure to move on this will risk overwhelming problems as COVID-19 continues or accelerates in the fall and winter. We could overwhelm the health system for sure if we have continuing COVID or even a rise in COVID if we don't plan now to control our annual influenza epidemic. Next slide. What you can do now, and I saw this uh, op-ed in the Times uh, a few days ago, by an ER physician, Richard Leviton, who came from uh, up in uh, New England to work for 10 days in New York City, busy emergency room. And his title was in the infection that's silently killing coronavirus. And it really messed with me. I always carry a pulse ox when I travel anyway and keep it at home. This simple device that measures oxygen saturation and a person has at any moment it's a vital measure that deteriorates in patients who have accelerating COVID-19. So you put it on your finger, and if you're usually at 96%, and now you drop down with a cough and you're not feeling well, it's 92% time to call your physician. Now, you can have free apps on your cell phone for the same thing, where you cover the photograph uh, light there. Um, they may not be quite as accurate, but it's worth getting that if you can't afford the pulse ox. Next slide. So I close with this uh, slide from uh, Camus, because I think what it uh, tells us, the author is using his protagonist to say, uh, here we are with a great deal of uncertainty, but also let's not forget to focus on the important people. And what the protagonist says, Dr. Rue, I have no idea what's awaiting me or what will happen when this all ends. But for the moment, there are sick people and they need curing. And I would say, as we look ahead to how we're gonna combat this in the future, recognize the reality of our uncertainty and the fact that there are people that are sick 
and dying of this COVID-19. I'll stop here, pause for questions and answers. Thank you very much, sir. Do appreciate it. And gang, I'm going to look at your questions in the Q&A box. So if you would, Krista and I think Catherine and Donna have questions in the chat. If you wouldn't mind just tossing those into the Q&A box, that's where I'm going to be looking to take your questions. Um, Dr. Wenzel, Tiffany asks, uh, what are your thoughts on travel in the late summer, early fall? So talking maybe October, September, August, uh, how likely is that? And she says, many of our partners are wondering whether or not they can safely attend future in-person meetings and events. So in her case, she's thinking maybe like mid-September. How likely is that to happen? Yeah, I think there's some reasons to be cautious and cautiously pessimistic. Uh, I don't think that this will open up widely for sure. So if you're talking about uh, international travel, large planes, um, eight hours in a confined space, uh, the newer planes that we've had now in the last decade compared to actually three decades ago uh, have more recirculated air. Uh, you still have to worry about surfaces. Uh, so I would think that uh, even late summer, um, this is probably not going to happen. And many of those, uh, if you're on a cruise, for example, are canceling already. Domestic travel, um, it depends on how creative the airlines are. I saw where JetBlue came out and said, in order to get on our planes, you're gonna to have to wear a mask, and so are we. I think that's a really step in the right direction. Um, and that may open up things, depending how much more we learn about the virus. If you're talking only about large droplets, um, that would get us uh, partly there. One of the worries I have is that there are some infections that might be spread by the smaller droplet nuclei, the aerosols. And these are the aerosols that hang in the air. And uh, in studies of tuberculosis, which is an aerosol bacterial infection, there were infections 15 rows away from somebody with active tuberculosis. Uh, and if somebody uses the restroom, uh, what if it, it's in a more confined space? So in China, they found aerosol um, indirectly, at least, that is, they found viral RNA in uh, restrooms hanging around. So I'd be a little concerned unless I hear much more from the airlines and, and how they're going to be creative about social distancing, keeping the air clean. I'm still a little uncomfortable about that for late summer. Uh, our friend Colby asks, do you agree with the argument that different communities may be able to follow different social distancing policies? For example, if you live in a dense urban community with high case prevalence, like New York City, you may need to be more strict in your distancing compared to, say, a rural community. Let's talk about, I don't know, someplace in Wyoming, maybe, with fewer or no local cases. Is it true that we're going to be able to be sort of piecemeal in our approach? We may be able to do that, but it all hinges on the accuracy of the information that you're basing your policy on. So I've showed you some of the shortcomings in a low prevalence uh, uh, community. And as long as we have the best available tests, high sensitivity specificity, recognizing the failings of a low prevalence, uh, at least to begin with, until we ramp it up, our, our infections widely. Um, in concept, that's all true. Because if we knew we had accurate numbers, we could be uh, a little um, more granular approach to a, a community with uh, limited crowding compared to New York City. So in concept, it's true. How it'll play out depends on how much reliability and how much predictive value we have with our testing. Okay, our friend Kelly asks, can you please speak to the antibody tests a little bit more? Because they're hitting the market. So many of us now have the ability to buy these things. How reliable are they? And are they useful in decision making? So maybe just make up a scenario. An employer buys a whole bunch of tests, manages to distribute them out to the team that's working at home. Is that a good way to think about making decisions about whether to get back into the office? Well, unfortunately, with the low prevalence, with only 5% of us, or maybe I've heard uh, the governor of New York Cuomo say at one time, well, it might be really 5%, it might be up to 15, and now I heard even higher. Uh, as we get higher, we still uh, get, you know, maybe 80% uh, predictive value for the positive 
test for antibodies, that's pretty good, but it means that one in five are false positives. And then the question for the employer is, are you willing to take the risk um, that um, you'll have enough, if you will, herd immunity by having four out of five for your business? And a lot, it's not exactly a, a closed community. It is closed for most of the day, whatever shift you're on. So um, there's still some risk, uh, and it depends on that sweet spot that it's a little hard to define now. But there's still some issues for the employer, uh, even if we get to 20% prevalence. I don't think we're that high, though. My friend Cindy asks, uh, and she's down in Florida, says, our governor has told us to go back to our workplaces beginning Monday of next week, citing that the media has spread unnecessary fear. Is this a case of livelihood over lives? So if you were advising the governor of Florida, what would you be telling that gentleman? Yeah, I would tell him that he's taking some risks. It's too early to open up. Uh, remember that Florida has a higher older population proportion than many other states. A lot of people retire to the beautiful areas of Florida. Um, I don't think he should want to take a risk on having his high risk people uh, exposed to people who are either out on the beaches or coming home, perhaps. Um, I think it's premature. Premature because uh, we have a lot of high-risk people and premature because we don't have widespread testing enough to say uh, where we are for sure. Um, and we know that uh, the things that work for international countries and for different states in our own country, those states and countries got early with strict social uh, distancing did better. I would hold out for a while. Maybe this is a case where I can take the privilege of asking a question. So uh, I'll just put it pretty plainly. Like, what's up with New Zealand? What did they do? What did they get right? Because they seem to have or are on a path to being literally COVID free. Either they are now or they will be within the next week. Yeah, they're remarkable. They have uh, remarkable leadership in Sweden and, and not Sweden, in New Zealand and in Australia. Both countries did uh, very similar. It's easier if you have an island uh, like New Zealand and you can prevent people from coming in and they did that very well. Remember that we had lots of people coming from New York or coming to New York from Europe uh, and we didn't close them off uh, very early. Uh, Norway or rather New Zealand did a wonderful job closing off uh, from outside. They, they also did a couple of other things they get into very early and strict social distancing. They did wonderful um, contact tracing of all the people and then isolated the contacts and they had widespread availability of testing as soon as it became available. So those four aspects put them in great shape and you can see the curves from uh, the first slide of data. They did remarkably well, uh, should be congratulated and uh, Totally different leadership, but both the use science to uh, guide their principles. Right. And just yet, for those who aren't going to be familiar with how it works in the Southern Hemisphere, Australia is a fairly right, politically right country, conservative country. And uh, Jacinda Ardern, who's the Prime Minister of New Zealand, that country tends to be a little bit more exactly. uh, theologically to the left, I guess is what you might say. They're obviously, neither of the systems are both parliamentary. They're not like the United States. But, but just in terms of ideological approach, both of them ultimately took a science-based approach and had the advantage of maybe being a little bit more isolated because they were islands or a sure. country, uh, island. Um, our colleague Catherine says, the predictions for what is going to be open and closed next year, is the USA specific or would this be true for Canada too? So uh, Catherine's up in Canada and so she's wondering, when you were saying maybe we'll see some small retail stores starting to open this summer with, with some distancing, um, likely we will not see major events, whether that's a ball game or uh, a conference or a trip to Disney World in this year. Um, does that apply to folks up in Canada as well or elsewhere? Well, I, I think it applies generally that uh, you get infection by being close to somebody else who is um, coughing or sneezing, or, but spewing uh, droplets of large or small sizes. Uh, and so that has to be your focus. Uh, and certainly six feet is the number that CDC has used. And for the most part, that's a very good guideline. Uh, it's not 100%, by the way. Uh, there are large droplets that can penetrate 
well beyond six feet on some occasions. So I think whether you're Canada or United States, uh, I don't think we're going to see the kind of entertainment uh, that we're used to with uh, the National Football League, for example, or the Hockey League, uh, or the major concerts where people are crowded together, at least in that fashion. Um, I look forward to anybody that has creative ideas on how you can do that uh, and have social distancing uh, with masks, uh, perhaps uh, better air exchanges, so, uh, distance between people who are attending those things. But uh, in terms of business as usual, uh, that's not going to happen uh, in the short run. Uh, Catherine followed up and said, uh, why are health authorities in North America, so the United States and Canada, uh, reluctant to make uh, wearing a mask uh, in stores and on public transit uh, mandatory? Why is that? Why has that not been made a rule when you see countries like the Czech Republic, Germany, Austria, and others have literally said you cannot go out and participate in public life unless you're wearing a mask? Any well, thoughts? I think they that? should, and I think it's a right policy, and I think it's good. My guess is that. Uh, they would run into uh, uh, libertarians who would really be upset, you know, people telling me anything, you know, even if it's to their own benefit of health, uh, as we've seen uh, some of them who marched without masks in crowded areas became sick and some died. Um, so I think maybe the sensitivity to the fact that we're an open country, an open democracy, and people can have dissent um, has maybe added to the issues that we're faced with. But I think it's the right thing to do. Um, and whether or not it would be effective to mandate it, that's another story. But I think it's the right thing to do. My friend Nicholas asks, are you able to speak about the vaccines that are currently under development? We've heard some reports in the popular media, the, the the case that seems to be top of mind for many people is the team in Oxford. Um, are there any issues of moving too fast in vaccine development or, or are you, without obviously knowing everything yet, are you optimistic about some of the things that we're hearing? And if so, why? Yeah, what I am optimistic. Um, there are a lot of labs, uh, Oxford is one in terms of uh, Europe and our own labs that have platforms that can be adapted to a new virus. And by that, I mean, if you're at Oxford and you're used to using some kind of recombinant vaccine, you have the platform and it might be a relatively harmless virus that will be injected into people, but that DNA or RNA rather of that virus, whatever virus is used, DNA or RNA, would have changes. It would have editing, which would include a gene to make a critical protein for COVID-19. And so when the virus was injected into you and then the, the virus started to then multiply and make more of that a protein, uh, we would develop antibodies to that uh, and protect us from infection from the COVID-19. That's the concept. Um, and the fact that they've already been working on these platforms uh, means that a lot of the short steps have been there early. The second thing that's happening, uh, mentioned both by the uh, group at Oxford and Tony Fauci today, is that as soon as they get a good signal that the vaccine is safe and may be protective before they wait to the final phase three result, they will start the production so they can have millions of doses available well before the, the answer is clear cut and definite. Well, that's a risk because it may turn out that there are more side effects than they wanted, or it wasn't as good as we thought initially. Um, but if you have 10 or 15 companies uh, out there trying uh, and enough uh, testing going on, you'll be able to say, yeah, this one works. These three work. And we have you know, 20 million doses already, and we can get to 100 million uh, in a couple of weeks. That's the, that's the hope. So I think I am very optimistic. This is the way to go. Uh, talk about remdesivir a little bit, because obviously many of us are reading about this or hearing about it on the news or on the radio. And, and, and in my mind, what it sounds like is it sort of has the effect of Tamiflu. Is that, is that, a, is that a fair analogy? Well, that, you know, it's just going to make it 
what what remdesivir is is a an antiviral first and as you know there are a couple of drugs that you would use to slow the virus down that have antiviral activity and then late in the disease i think we're still going to have to deal with the immune response that's overwhelming uncoordinated and actually kills the host as part of the friendly fire if you will of our immune system this is the site so, form these are like the monoclonal antibodies. The cerulamab, for example, is one. Uh, and there, there are a couple of them out there. So one, we have to control the virus. And at least we have proof of concept with remdesivir that, yeah, we can go that route. We also need the far end to, we need to dampen the immune response and not lose sight of that. Remdesivir looks like it saved about four days um, of time to get to uh, back to a healthier state. Uh, so that's good. It uh, didn't quite make statistical difference in terms of mortality, something like about 11% uh, versus eight. So not a huge actual number, but the proportion would be, you know, pretty impressive uh, if we knew that it was uh, significant. It didn't quite make that. And I think that's probably because didn't have enough statistical power in a small number of cases. So I don't think that's going to turn out to be a phenomenal drug, but it's a, an encouraging first start. Gotcha. And it's sort of, I mean, again, I think the, 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 the sort of context I have as a parent is a kid gets sick and maybe you give them a dose of Tamiflu and it doesn't make them better. It just means the flu lasts rather than four days, it's three or two. Correct. Still a sick little kid, but. Yeah, no, but. The, and if it turns out, you'd like to think that maybe somebody will look at this drug as a preventive drug. Because preventive drugs, so back to the Tamiflu analogy, 90% as a preventive drug, wonderful, very modest as a therapeutic drug. Gotcha. Our friend Debbie asks, what's your concern for states that are popular travel destinations when people start traveling again? So for instance, Florida and other coastal locations, the beaches are going to be very, very popular and be probably perceived as a safe outdoor space to go to. Um, what's the consequence of, of that when we start seeing folks as the weather warms heading out to the beach and, and how do you control it? Well, the real issue is crowding. How close are you to somebody else? who might be a symptomatic or an asymptomatic uh, carrier of the virus. Um, the second part of that, as you think about this, put it in perspective, one is crowding. The second is, who's going to be at the beaches? Um, if it's young people, the risk of infection doesn't go down, but the risk of uh, death certainly is very, very low. If the grandparents start going to crowded beaches, uh, that's a real bad move. Um, you probably won't see a lot of the people who I listed as the losers in every pandemic, poor people, uh, people who just don't have funding, uh, unregistered aliens, uh, meat packers. Uh, um, so I think you, these are two perspectives to think of. One, who's going to be there and uh, crowding. With crowding, you still have a risk of starting a small cluster again. Remember, even if you think many more proportions of our country are infected than five, and so let's say you want to argue it's 15, that's still 85% of people susceptible. And that's a lot of people who, if we had another wave, would move very quickly. You saw just the uh, April uh, deaths go from 2,000 to uh, 60,000 in 30 days. So I still worry about crowding. And your expectation is, is that we're still, you know, within the next month, and this will presumably look like progress, we're going to be at about 100,000 plus deaths uh, if, we, if and when we talk again in, in, in June. Yeah, I think that a doubling time of 30 days is, is possible. I'd love to see it longer than that and be wrong and have, you know, maybe 80,000, but it's possible that we could easily reach 100,000 in one month. Okay. Uh, Donna asks, earlier you had mentioned that a prior infection for COVID may mean immunity. Uh, do we really have enough evidence to suggest that this might be the case? Because she's heard otherwise. What's your take? So do, do we think that this is like many, many viruses where you get infected and then um, chicken pox, you get it and presumably you don't get it again? Well, I think 
you know, based on uh, other coronaviruses, probably we will, anybody infected will get antibodies as a marker of immunity, at least for some time. And um, if you look at the experience with SARS or, or MERS, it looks as though some of that immunity wanes over a couple of years. I think in the short term, uh, if you're infected, you're probably uh, protected. There have been people who have tested negative for the virus uh, and then come back with symptoms and, and then they're test positive. What I don't know is whether those people had a false negative to begin with, probably not because I think they're pretty good. Or, and they came back and it was part of the same spectrum. Um, or was there something else going on? Um, I think that the good news is no matter what, the people who came back had fewer symptoms than their first episode. So I'm still overall optimistic that uh, an infection, at least in the short term years, couple of years will will be protected. My friend Phoebe asks, if an organization's employees can and have the privilege and luxury of being able to do their work from home, would you recommend that those folks continue to work remotely even after stay-at-home orders are lifted? Uh, and would you encourage employers to adopt policies of keeping staff at home? And then if yes, for how long? So a couple of questions packed in there, but I think the thought would be, if you had the choice as an employer and you could have your employees working remotely, they've been doing so successfully, would your recommendation be, let's keep that in place for as long as possible? Well, I'd like to use the uh, data that we might have with reliable testing to help uh, answer that. Uh, and that would be maybe looking at the change in case numbers or deaths over a 14 or 28 day period. Uh, looking at the prevalence of antibodies in a random sample. So it'd be nice to have some guidance as I try to uh, uh, emphasize. Uh, for the early summer, I would be dragging my heels and saying, look, we're really on the right path now. The curves are going in the right direction. Uh, if you don't need the person, I would try to go a little bit longer. Um, there's gonna be the tension of the people wanting to get back to the office as well as the pull from public health to say we're on the right pathway. Again, where that is, I think will in part depend on how creative the business office is at trying to keep people at some social distance at work, wear a mask, uh, keep people away from each other, don't crowd together in groups of 10 or more and have lunch where you have the mask off. Um, you know, have, how well are they cleaning the hard surfaces? So I mean, an employer who wants to have his people back, I think um, they have to come up with a plan of how they're gonna minimize uh, transmission. Next question comes from our friend Nicholas who asked, how accurate are the oral swab tests? Um, specifically, LA County now has open oral swab tests available to all of its residents after previously restricting those to just pit folks with symptoms. Um, how, how good are those tests? Well, the virus is very high in the nose and the mouth, not just uh, in the lungs. So if the virus test, uh, I'd say it's probably fairly accurate. I have not seen data, so I have to sort of uh, codify my answer a little bit and say, you know what, uh, I, I'm not sure of the answer to that. But in general, virus is high in the nose, and that's why the nasal and oral probably work fairly well but I want him to check the numbers. The next question comes from our friend Donna, and she says, it's interesting you don't think that prevalence is that high. Uh, do you think, do you dispute suggestions that the, that the virus is more prevalent amongst our population, but not detected because of the lack of testing, and that many who are infected may be asymptomatic and therefore unlikely to get tested? Um, what's the basis for the assertion that the prevalence must be lower? Well, the group at uh, Stanford did the prevalence and they found about 5%, which they said, you know, this is 50 times higher or 80 times higher than what we thought. Um, so it depends where you sort of want to put the numbers together. I think for sure the prevalence is higher than we thought. Uh, we thought maybe we were at 1% or so, two or a little more. So at least five. New York, uh, they think that it might be as high, somewhere between five and 25. Um, that may be true for some parts of the country. Uh, so I would certainly agree that 
the prevalence is um, much higher than we thought. And whether it's closer to five or closer to 15 or 20, uh, I don't know. It may be both are correct uh, for different parts uh, of the country. So uh, I don't argue with the people who say there's much more out there than we thought. Uh, I would love to see random samples and not just convenient samples. So what they did with Stanford is use uh, people to, who are active on Facebook. Well, that's not a random sample of people. You know, the people in their 70s aren't always on Facebook. Uh, and so I'd love to see a random sample, high proportion. 3,000 is much less than 1% of the population. I would love to see what uh, Iceland did, test 10% random sample of our people to have a better idea. But again, totally agree that there's much more out there than we thought. Uh, Lishka asks, and it kind of dovetails into this, what are the major holdups for the U.S. getting testing out more widespread? Why, why have we had challenges here? Why are we so far behind? Specifically, her question is, is it leadership or is it materials or is it some combination of those things? Well, I would put it as some combination. We could have used executive uh, orders to get companies to get the tests ready. Um, we haven't done that. Um, and uh, I think we, if we want to label this uh, with the war metaphor, and there are a lot of negatives and positives about that, um, then you would say we need more masks, we need more shields, we need more gloves, we need access to uh, disinfectants, uh, and we need testing, both for the virus and for antibody. And I don't think we put all our, uh, our uh, political and administrative uh, uh, efforts into that to really get that going. Uh, and I, I think it's coming. Uh, it's much slower than people thought. Uh, Nancy says, there are many groups in uh, a number of states that are protesting uh, the, the shutdowns uh, despite medical advice. And she says, needless to say, it is within the states uh, with the tightest shutdown regulations. They already have they are already disregarding mandates of distancing and masks. Other than hibernating, I don't know how we can protect ourselves from this. So how do we manage the fact that some of our neighbors are maybe starting to have a little bit of the stir crazies or just aren't willing or able to, to abide by some of these orders? Any thoughts there? Well, it's a difficult question because, um, uh, again, uh, social distancing works. If you're vulnerable, um, you should maintain your social distancing. I would say that to people. Uh, and you may have to have a discussion on the phone with uh, your neighbors who say, you know, that we're overblowing this. Uh, the media are, are making us fearful. I don't think it's as bad. I live in an area where it's not New York. Whatever is going on, including, you know, the Orthodox people who wanted to go to a funeral in New York recently and uh, had to be broken up by the police. Uh, so they're risking their own health when they do that. Um, and what you want to do if you're vulnerable, and I keep focusing on that group, maintain your distance. People who are over age 65 will be using masks well into the fall, even if uh, we get really control of this thing, maybe uh, through our social distancing or perhaps with help from new drugs before then. Um, we can't afford to drop our guard, I think. Our friend Jennifer's in Nashville, hopefully safe and well, uh, asks, what's the simplest way that we can shoot down the narrative that COVID-19's death and infection rates are just the equivalent of the flu? So apparently in, in Tennessee and some other states, that's the story. This is just a really bad flu. How do we counter that when we hear that from a neighbor or a friend or even a family member? Yeah, well, first I would say, you know, uh, influenza on average does cause 36,000 deaths a year. Um, that's not trivial. And I wish we had a better vaccine and better drugs. In only a couple of months, not a whole year, we now have 60,000 deaths. That's a real fact. Um, and even using very conservative numbers, that is looking at all the asymptomatic people who are out there, uh, we're finding um, who might have antibodies, moving our denominator uh, wider, we would still, being conservative, have a mortality of 0.3. 0.5%, including all those, that's still the three to, three to five times that of the ordinary flu. So I think the, the evidence is really there, no matter what, how you look at it, um, that uh, we, we're really, this is a serious, 
maybe even more contagious virus than influenza, uh, and it's killing people. Um, uh, and uh, I don't think that uh, you can go long, much longer and just say, this is trivial. Uh, I'm going to take the privilege of a question as someone who lives with two small people in the house. What are the chances of summer camp happening? I think very low. Uh, it's just kids are going to aggregate together. You really can't keep them apart. That's what makes them wonderful. Yep. Uh, and uh, I don't think that uh, they, uh, I mean, if you could isolate them in a room where they, you know, they did fine for, 28 days and then they all went to camp and only uh, had counselors that had isolated themselves for 28 days and no infections. Okay, that might work. That's not it. That's not reality. I don't think it'll happen this summer. That makes me think that the swimming pool is probably not in the offing for us either. I don't think so. I think uh, not this year. Gotcha. Uh, I'm going to take one more question from our colleagues. We've gone over time. You've been very generous. I'm also going to, because I have you captive here for a quick minute, would you mind coming back in a couple of weeks for, for an update? If it helps you and yeah. the people out there, I, I would love to. Be helpful help to yeah, thank you very, thank very you. much. So uh, Ruth asks, uh, can you speak to the issue of false negatives in these antibody tests of symptomatic individuals, especially in the tests that are not approved through the FDA? So for those of us who are just not physicians, this is all, you know, we're trying to catch up, but it's hard to understand. So there, there are two aspects to the answer. One is, uh, no matter what the prevalence is, the uh, false negative antibody um, uh, are going to be very low, you know, in a uh, in a 1% to a couple more percent. The problem is the first steps. Did they start out with an antibody test that's 95% or better in the sensitivity specificity? Um, and I put best case scenario for the antibody test in my example. But what if it's only 80? Then you have problems, uh, you know, with false positives and negatives both. Um, so uh, I think if you have a good test, uh, most of the time, if you have symptoms it's, and you get a negative antibody test, it's probably really negative. You have another virus, perhaps. And that's why I'd like to see a whole spectrum of viruses, a multiplex testing swab. So it tells you what virus you have. And you'll be much more reassured than just to say, looks like you don't have COVID, you know, and then you're, you're left with that nagging sense of, you know, is it real? So is I just I, I sometimes think in best when I kind of compare things or make an analogy is this kind of like these antibody tests it's kind of like when you go to a bar a fancy bar where they have the fancy beers and one has six percent alcohol and another one has four percent another one has two percent they're all beer but obviously you drink one it's gonna it's gonna affect you differently than maybe another so these antibody tests are just not made equally is that is that the bottom line well I would say they vary I'm not sure I'd make the analogy to different beers but. Because we're talking about how much alcohol, but it's uh, how much punch they have to have the right answer, if you want to do it that way. Yeah. Uh, and some are heavy hitters, and they're up in the 90 high, 5, 98, 99%. First phase, you know, sensitivity, specificity, terrific. Um, some aren't. Gotcha. All right, I'm going to take the last privilege uh, before we let you run, which is we've been trying to get in touch with my little sister, Becky, and she's not answering. So if you happen to see her or talk to her, would you tell her to call my dad? He's a little bit nervous. Uh, Those sure. of you who don't know, Dr. Wenzel is a mentor of my sister. who's a physician down in Richmond, and she's a pulmonologist, so we're a little worried about her. I'm sure Excellent, she's too. really busy, I'll, but if you don't mind, maybe she'll listen to you. Have her call my dad. Terrific. All right. Thank you, sir. Thanks, everybody. Be safe, healthy, and well. Stay inside. Wash your hands. Uh, any other advice, Dr. Wenzel, that they can do for the next two weeks before we get the chance to visit with you again? Stay safe. You know what it means. Yes, we do. Well, thank you very much. Incredibly kind of you. Again, uh, and Great we hope pleasure. you are safe, healthy, and well, and everybody in the, in the family there. So we'll talk to you soon, everybody. Be safe. Great. Talk to you soon. Cheers.